Our first speaker today is, is Dr. Keith Phillips. Keith joined the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas in January 1984. His areas of concentration include regional economics and economic forecasting. Research papers in economics, which tracks publications in economics, ranks him in the top 5% of economists across the world in terms of number of distinct publications. For the past 16 years, he has been the most accurate forecaster for Texas's job growth in the Western Blue Chip Economic Forecast. You ever worry you're going to lose like year 17? No? <laughs> so it's a problem with these streaks. Like we have this 10 years in number one in accounting, and we live in fear of falling to number two. Um, so Keith, most of us would be happy with number two. In August 1996, he was transferred to the San Antonio branch in an effort to improve the regional economic coverage of the Dallas office and to better serve the needs of the South Texas community. He teaches managerial economics in the executive MBA program at UTSA. He earned his PhD in economics from Southern Methodist University and a BA and MA in economics and a Bachelor of Journalism degree in news and editorial from the University of Missouri at Columbia. So with that, please join me in welcoming Keith Phillips to the stage. Well, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been uh, doing this for several years now, and I really like the way the program is set up. Uh, Gail does a great job. One economist and two uh, practitioners, two people are actually out there in the real world running businesses. Um, the economist uh, kind of flies over the forest and looks at the data from above, and the practitioners are in the forest every day looking at uh, and hearing things about uh, what's happening. And that reminds me of a story uh, of an economist that was walking along a country road and he came across a big flock of sheep. And he went up to the shepherd and he said, I bet you 100 bucks for one of your sheep that I can tell you exactly how many sheep you have in your flock. Well, the shepherd knew that he had a big flock that was well dispersed. So he said, uh, I'll take that bet. Um, and so the economist looks around and he kind of uses the uh, big data uh, training he got as an undergrad at UT and he kind of figures out the dispersion and so after a few minutes he turns to the shepherd and said, you have 236 sheep in your flock. And the shepherd says, wow, that's amazing. That's ex exactly correct. You win. So the economist uh, picks up an animal, starts to walk away, and the shepherd said, hey, wait a minute, I bet you 100 bucks for that animal, I can tell you what profession you're in. So the economist thinks, and he thinks, well, he'll probably guess statistician, data scientist, mathematician, something like that. So the economist said, I'll take that bet. And the shepherd said, I bet you're an economist. And the economist said, wow, how'd you know that? And the shepherd said, well, put down my dog and I'll tell you. <laughs> so I'm here to, to count sheep and the other two guys are here because they can tell the difference between a sheep and a dog. So anyway, I have a bunch of slides which I think are about to come up. Is that true? Oh, I just pressed the button. Okay. So I'm going to take a look at the Texas economy real quickly since I spent half my time on my joke. Uh, I'm going to uh, keep it short. Uh, the Texas economy uh, moderated somewhat last year, but overall really uh, had a good year. The, the biggest thing constraining uh, growth in the state uh, really was uh, labor force. Uh, when we talked to businesses across the state, uh, one of the key things they mentioned is uh, labor force. And Jay, Jay mentioned the, the restriction on uh, immigration. Uh, the student thing is affecting many uh, universities and particularly even smaller colleges that get a large amount of foreign students. But overall, the immigration issue is affecting labor force growth. But uh, labor markets are at historically tight levels and uh, that's particularly true in Texas even though we see a lot of still see a lot of net immigration from other states but kind of putting the Texas economy last year in perspective Texas came out of the Great Recession one of the strong top three states in the nation in terms of job growth in 2015 and 16 oil prices collapsed and we slowed to um, blow the national average for the first time in 13 years. But in 17 and 18, oil prices picked up again, and we returned to our normal kind of 
place, which is job growth above the national <coughs> average. But last year, uh, while we, we remained above the national average in job growth, uh, we did see some dampening due to uh, a, uh, a moderate decline in the oil and gas sector. And I say moderate because typically when oil prices swing, they swing big time, and we see a collapse in oil prices and a collapse in the energy sector. Last year we saw you know, oil prices hovering right above the average break-even price for new drilling, and so the rig count fell but didn't collapse. So last year, energy slowed, and second half of the year, we saw some weakening of manufacturing. Manufacturers have been uh, hit by a lot of different things, uh, but tariffs have certainly been one, uh, raising input costs uh, to many manufacturers, and then retaliatory tariffs uh, reducing demand. So. Uh, and the strong dollar also uh, weakened manufacturing uh, somewhat. But in the second half of the year, even with the weakening of manufacturing, uh, the uh, service sector actually improved, uh, and the Texas leading index picked up. Some of the uncertainty surrounding tariffs uh, began to wane, and uh, we had a overall a slight pickup in the Texas economy in the second half of last year. Overall job growth last year slowed from 2.4% in 2018 uh, to 2.0%, which is right about its long-term average. This year, it would, coming into the year, we have less trade uncertainty. Uh, we have uh, the USMCA passage, and we have the first round of the China deal going through, and so uh, that's a, a source of reduced uncertainty uh, while uh, we do have uncertainty surrounding the elections uh, uh, that, that can continue to put kind of a damper on overall investment. But overall, the forecast I have for Texas, if you want to not pay attention to the rest of the presentation, is that job growth is going to be close to last year. We're going to see about 2.1% job growth versus 2% last year. This is, you know, roughly point estimates with a pretty broad confidence band. But uh, overall, pretty close, and with this uh, pace of job growth, the unemployment rate in Texas is likely to tick down a few uh, uh, basis points, uh, even though right now, they're, uh, at, in November anyway, we're at the slowest level ever recorded since the mid-70s. So this is just Texas job growth. The black bars are Texas, red is the U.S. And you can see we're usually above, I should have put orange on there. But anyway, uh, we're usually above the national average. Um, uh, historically, we're about 1%. Uh, we, our job growth rate is about 2.1. The U.S. is about 1.1. And you can see this pattern shows that our long, in long term, it really has very little to do with the oil and gas sector. But we end up talking about the oil and gas sector a lot when oil prices swing up and down because the oil and gas industry can have a, an important cyclical effect. You can see in 1999, Texas dipped below the national average even though that was a high-tech boom. And that was because West Texas Intermediate crude hit $11 a barrel. And then we kind of returned above the national average. And then, as I mentioned, in 15 and 16, we went below the national average because oil prices sunk into the 40s. Uh, and then we're, we bounce back up and we're above the national average again. But Texas does better in the long run because we have a lower cost of living and a lower cost of doing business. Uh, companies, basically what states grow faster than others? You have to answer two questions. Uh, where do people want to live and where can companies maximize profit? And Texas has been one of those states and will, will continue to do so, although as housing prices escalate in our major MSAs, uh, it's going to be more and more of a challenge. Just keep those regulations down. So the unemployment rate, as I said, is historically low. It kind of ticked up in December to 3.5, uh, and the U.S. was at uh, 3.5. And uh, but uh, overall, both the U.S. and Texas facing historically tight labor markets. Uh, job growth in Texas. This is job growth across the major MSAs in the state. Uh, the slowdown last year was moderate from 2.4 to 2.0, but most of it occurred in Houston. Now, Houston is, a, you know, the global center of energy, and it, uh, it, despite the decline in oil prices, it remained growing at a pretty good pace, 1.6 percent, but it slowed from a full percentage point from 2.6 uh, the previous year in 2018. 
Whereas Dallas and Austin just re continue to grow at, a, at, at fast rates of growth. Austin usually is one of the fastest growing MSAs in the state and, and in the nation. Uh, Fort Worth picked up a little and then San Antonio uh, also picked up. Across uh, uh, industries, we see a similar story that uh, the, the weakness last year was centered in oil and gas. Uh, you can see oil and gas went from about 10 percent job growth to minus 5 percent job growth, whereas most other industries uh, continue to grow uh, at a moderate to strong pace. Uh, construction was one of the fa was the fastest growing of the large sectors. We had a significant increase in, in uh, housing activity as mortgage rates fell a full percentage point. And with this long expansion and low unemployment, you have more and more people with a job history uh, and then with the, low on a, with the low mortgage rate, you have more people that can qualify for a given income. Five minutes, okay, I can do that. Okay, um, this uh, chart shows that what I was just talking about, about the construction sector, uh, the mortgage rate tends to lead building activity by, by about three months. And from October of 2018 to August of last year, the mortgage rate fell a full percentage point and you can see a big rise in this orange line, which is the single family housing permits. Uh, it grew by 20% from about March to uh, uh, November. And um, mortgage rates now have kind of flattened out. Um, and that means that housing uh, permits and starts are likely to continue at a strong level, but just not grow as much uh, as they did last year. So I mentioned that the manufacturing sector was under uh, pressure last year. Uh, so we have this survey of manufacturers we do uh, and service sector uh, respondents. This, this particular question was responded to by 360 respondents across the state. And we asked what impact have U.S. and foreign tariffs implemented since last year had on the following aspects of your firm's business. The blue bars are manufacturing and the green are the service sector. And you can see both of them were negatively impacted on, on net. And now some people did get positive impacts, but on, uh, the impacts in general were negative. Uh, input costs rose uh, more for manufacturers and service sector. Uh, and their selling prices also rose, but not as much. And so you can see on the, the far right that profit margins fell, uh, capital spending fell, and such. So this is the tariffs were a negative impact overall on the manufacturing sector. Our service sector, we have a service sector survey, largest in the U.S., uh, and uh, they finished the year pretty weak. Uh, it was weak throughout the year. You can see employment declines uh, in, in the fourth quarter. The company outlook actually slightly turned positive, uh, and uncertainty fell a little bit. But producers expect the, it to finish the year at $58. This was before the coronavirus started kind of impacting oil prices, which fell below 50 yesterday. Uh, but the coronavirus is still a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, if uh, medical doctors probably know more about this than I do, I don't know what the, fact, the, the impact is going to be. Uh, but if it was like SARS, it'll be very temporary. Uh, SARS. Uh, and uh, so we don't know, but right now it's having a, uh, a negative effect on oil, oil prices uh, and overall suggests even more weakness uh, than what the respondents suggested in the fourth quarter. So I like this chart, so I'll spend a second on it. Even, I don't have many seconds left, but so Texas is affected by a lot of things and national factors such as interest rates, uh, national policies, all those things affect Texas just like they do other states. Uh, so to factor that out, I looked at US, uh, Texas job growth minus US. And this is the kind of extra job growth we get in Texas. And a lot of times those movements in this job growth, as I mentioned before, due to swings in oil prices. And this is the real oil price, oil price adjusted for inflation. And you can see big swings in this red line are followed by swings in this gray line, which is Texas relative job growth to the U.S. And you can see, and like I said, in 15 and 16, oil prices collapsed, and we, we continue to grow in Texas, uh, but below the national average. And now we're above the national average. This red line leads the gray line by about six months. So the, 
and the last six months is kind of a forecast for the net first six months of this year, and it suggests Texas, like my forecasting model, suggests that Texas will continue to grow faster than the national average in terms of job growth. One minute. So the outlook from our services sector continues to increase. Manufacturing continues to be kind of weak overall. My leading index has been very uh, actually uh, increasing with most of the components increasing uh, over the three months through December. Uh, this puts out a forecast in my model of about 2.1 percent, pretty close to last year. So in summary, the national economy, which is certainly important for Texas, most forecasters expect the national economy to slow somewhat but remain positive. We kind of got over that negative yield curve thing, uh, although so, uh, the coronavirus is bringing down long rates once again. But overall, forecasters expect positive growth in the national economy. That's good for Texas. Texas will remain stronger than the national economy in terms of job growth. Uh, historically tight labor markets continue to constrain job growth. Uh, we'll see about similar job growth as last year. The unemployment rate at, uh, in December was 3.5. Uh, before that was 3.4. It may go down to 3.2, which once again, the, our unemployment started in the mid-70s, and this will be uh, lower than it's ever been. Uh, biggest downside risks are always risk uh, to the forecast. If oil prices uh, turn out to be uh, under $50 for the year, between 40 and 50, uh, this forecast will go to crap uh, and it'll be weaker. Uh, but if oil prices are at $100 a barrel, it's going to be stronger here. Uh, energy companies will pay just about anything when oil prices are at high to attract workers from other states. Uh, so uh, oil price is always a risk. Trade war escalation right now seems to have dampened down, but it could always uh, uh, re-escalate. Uh, and then the yield curve, uh, which I don't have time to get into, uh, uh, is still somewhat of a concern that it dipped below zero for a couple months. Uh, and we'll see what happens there, but the mean expectation is the U.S. to continue to grow. So that's my remarks, and I think I made it pretty close uh, to the time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Keith. I'm, I'm going to borrow that go to crap line. That's, that's, a, that's <laughs> a very good description. So. Um, I'm now uh, happy to turn it over to Brian Grunhaber. And I got to know Brian. Uh, many of you are probably aware, but uh, UT's made this big bet in health and healthcare with the opening of the Dell Medical School. And we as a business school are, are part of that story and very excited about it. And uh, so we have a joint venture with Dell Med called the Value Institute, where we're thinking about uh, how do we engender more value-based competition in the healthcare sector. And as part of that, we realized we didn't have enough of our healthcare alumni involved, and that's how we uh, got to Brian. And it's been great over the last couple of years to get to know Brian and get him uh, engaged with the school more and more, because uh, quite frankly, we've needed his help. Uh, so with that, thanks for doing this today, Brian. Uh, Brian is responsible for the overall operations of WellMed Medical, Medical Management, Inc., the award-winning diversified healthcare enterprise. With more than 6,500 employees, WellMed supports more than 13,000 providers with various medical management services. Overall, WellMed provides quality healthcare services for more than 315,000 Medicare eligible patients. Before joining WellMed, he worked at Anthem, where he ran a multi specialty IPA joint venture. IPA like the beer or something different? Um, medical term. Medical term, <laughs> got it, okay. He also worked in mergers and acquisitions with Anthem during the first two years, uh, first, sorry, first two mergers with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, health plans, insurance companies. Brian also previously worked in the consulting division for both Ernst & Young and Deloitte & Touche. A CPA and a member of the AICPA, he earned his MBA in finance and accounting from the Macomb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. He also earned a BS in industrial management with distinction from Purdue University. Brian currently serves as the chair of the Healthcare Advisory Council for the Macomb School at the University of Texas at Austin. With that, please join me in welcoming Brian to the stage. Thank you, everybody. Um, when the dean asked me to do this, um, I thought that's going to be pretty risky because the thing I'm most familiar with and I want to talk to you about is about senior citizens and healthcare. So I'm not sure if there's anything more boring than that, but we'll see. Um, 
So by show of hands, how many people are familiar with the Medicare Advantage program? Okay, a few people. I'll, um, so basically what the Medicare Advantage program is, it's a program that's been uh, set up for seniors that they can opt out of regular Medicare and into the Medicare Advantage program. Um, they pay the same uh, uh, Medicare uh, Part B uh, uh, payment as a deduction from their Social Security check, but they select a health plan for their coverage. And in exchange for that, they get lower co-pays and other value-added benefits. When you look at it in total, it is almost $2,500 a year of actuarial value over and above what the Medicare covers. So it's kind of a no-brainer for a lot of seniors. Um, my dad was on it, my mom's still on it, um, and he always used to ask me, now, how can this work? There's gotta be a catch here. How can you, how can you give me $2,500 more in benefits than what I get in Medicare? Well, I'll cover a little bit on that as to how it works, but it really does uh, work very well for many, many seniors in the United States. Um, so how did it get started? Um, it was a piece of legislation that was passed in 2003. Uh, prior to that, it had been called Medicare Plus Choice and a few other names. It's kind of had a up and down history. But since 2003, it's been on a straight upward trajectory. Um, and from my perspective, it's been interesting because it was probably the last true bipartisan legislation that I'm aware of. Um, you had the far right that thought, uh, another entitlement. You had the far left that said, oh, we're not giving them enough. And so it truly was the middle that came together to create this legislation. Um, and as we all know, there is no middle anymore now, so that doesn't happen. The other thing is, interestingly enough, is it's probably one of the only pieces of legislation that I'm aware of that actually came in under budget from the original projections of what it was supposed to cost. Uh, so it has been very, very effective for controlling and bending the cost curve overall. Uh, so from a demographic perspective, you have twice as many people turning 65 every day as compared to two, 10 years ago. So from, from my business perspective, as I always say, they keep making old people at an ever faster rate. Um, and that's great demographics for, for my business. Um, they're, they're projecting right now that um, almost 23% of all Americans will be in Medicare by the year 2030. So you needed something from a legislation perspective that really is, has been able to have a great impact. So when I look at it, it's a win for patients, it's a win for the government, and for our doctors, it's a win for them. Because these benefits that they are able to um, uh, give to their patients are tools that help them care for their patients better. Lower uh, RX uh, pharmacy co-pays. People are compliant with their drug regimens. They live better, healthier lives. Uh, lowered barriers to care transportation, uh, home visits, other things like that. Um, proven, lower barriers to care, you get better um, health care overall. And a lot of value-added benefits that help patients stay independent and at home. So when you add all that up together, it really is a win-win overall. So as a result of that, you've seen an absolute explosion in the number of people that are enrolled in the Medicare Advantage program. When it was passed in 2003, there were approximately 5 million uh, Americans that were on Medicare Advantage. In 2020, that number is now in excess of 24 million uh, people. So almost a five-fold increase during that 17-year time period. Uh, it's obviously wildly popular with seniors. Uh, over 80% of them give either a uh, happy or extremely happy uh, uh, survey outcome relative to this program. Uh, so they're feeling the benefit of it. Give you some statistics. Um, 
So overall, nationally, since 2015, uh, premiums for this have decreased by 25%. Um, in San Antonio, virtually all of the plans that are offered are zero premium. So you don't pay anything more than what your, your normal Medicare payment is. Um, Out-of-pocket uh, maxes have been decreasing again by about that same 25%. Nationally, that's about $5,000 of max out-of-pocket. In San Antonio, that average is somewhere around $3,500. 67% um, of all seniors get a dental benefit as part of this, which isn't covered by Medicare, obviously. 72% get a fitness membership uh, to a, a gym. So again, healthier, active lives, reduce costs. 78% um, get uh, free eye exams and access to glasses. In San Antonio, virtually all the plans offer those benefits in addition to um, free transportation to and from uh, doctor's visits. So again, lowering the barriers to care. In Texas, 38% of all uh, Medicare eligibles are on the Medicare Advantage plan. That's on the high end. I think nationally it's about 34% uh, of seniors. Florida is the highest at 43%, so you can see about where Texas uh, stands on that. So 1.8 million of the 4.6 million Medicare eligibles in Texas are on uh, the Medicare Advantage pro program. The most important aspect of that to me is um, what's happening uh, for the poorest uh, of the, and the sickest. Uh, so there's a subset of the Medicare Advantage plans. They're called chronic special needs plans and dual special needs plans. So I, I'll refer to them as a C-SNP or a D-SNP. Um, so to qualify for a, a D-SNP in general, you have to be at 100% of the federal poverty level or below. The number of enrollees in DSNP nationally has gone from 1.1 million in 2015 to 2.9 million in 2020. In Texas, that number's gone from 160,000 in 15 to 285,000 in 2020. Um, what you're seeing also as part of that is a lot of uh, additional social determinants of health investments i uh, talked about transportation, uh, a lot of uh, prescription assistance programs, um, and now uh, the, I think one of the biggest things you're gonna see now are in-home services uh, for patients to help with ramps and, bar and uh, barriers within their home, as well as solving the issue of uh, food insecurity. Um, from my perspective, again, there's significant policy ramifications uh, from this, obviously. Uh, talked a little bit about caring for some of the poorest and the, the sickest. Um, the average age of our patients is 79 years of age. So think about how many 85 and 90 year olds we have to balance out the number of 65 year olds that age in every year. 55% uh, of all recipients are females. 60% of all Hispanics in the, in, that are Medicare eligible in the United States are on Medicare Advantage, and over 50% of all African Americans. So again, I think that's something that has been great policy overall, and has really helped those that are most in need. Uh, so I encourage anybody that's got parents or grandparents or others that are um, needing that, uh, it should be something that, that you consider, and for those of us that are getting close to that age, something you might want to uh, be, uh, pay attention to. And I promise you, it's a true case where you, there is a free lunch. You get something for nothing. Um, obviously, I'm very biased. Uh, the numbers are a bit dated. We now have exceeded over 500,000 Medicare Advantage uh, patients uh, throughout Texas and Florida, which are our two service areas. Um, we have a mixed model where we have both uh, people that are seen in a well-med clinic, there's 24 of them here in San Antonio, uh, as well as contracted phys physicians. So in San Antonio, we've got 100 employed physicians and greater than 300 contracted physicians. Um, 
It has been selected as a, as a center of excellence within uh, Optum and United Healthcare. Uh, so we'll be building a big service center here in San Antonio locally. Um, and we also have the WellMed Charitable Foundation, which has given away almost $5 million in donations to largely our seniors give as a way to give back to our patients and our customers um, in the local community. Um, uh, Jay also asked me to talk a little bit about a few of the national trends that I'm seeing and some of the things that we see from health healthcare in general. Um, I think it's been, it was talked about a little bit earlier, but it, the single biggest deterrent to our explosive growth is the ability to get healthcare professionals. So it's most acute in the primary care space. Our model is very dependent on primary cares. That's the, the uh, uh, primary way that we uh, have them be patient advocates. Um, and as most of you know, there is an enormous shortage of physicians nationally. I think the number I've seen recently is the average age of a primary care physician in the United States is somewhere in the low 50s, 52, 53 years of age. Uh, so the demographics are not in our favor relative to um, the production of our most important asset in our company. So as uh, uh, Dean said, we've been partnering with many medical schools throughout um, Texas, uh, including Dell Medical School, where we're actually um, going in and uh, doing residency programs so that they can come in and see what it's like to work in an ambulatory setting, realize that primary care uh, physicians' life uh, can be better. Uh, the average number of patients that our doctors see per day is somewhere around 16 to 18 patients a day. So for primary care physicians that really want to get engaged and involved in their, the uh, patient's care, this has been uh, ideal for them. But you've got to get them exposed to that through residency programs. We've also um, actually have now funded scholarships for uh, people that are in medical school, again, trying to influence their decision to stay in primary care as opposed to going into specialty care and subspecialty care. Um, one of the biggest programs that we've been supporting is the new uh, uh, medical school here at UIW, uh, where we have a number of, scholar of uh, people that are in the school that are on um, scholarships. So we view that we have to invest in our future um, if we're going to be able to be successful. That includes what's happening um, on, with uh, the rest of our clinical staff. Um, there, the main thing that we've done is to invest in continuing education. Uh, so we've had a number of medical assistants that have moved up to be licensed vocational nurses, um, LVNs, LVNs that have moved up to be uh, RNs, and RNs that have actually gone and become advanced practice clinicians. Um, we haven't had anybody yet that um, used this to go to medical school, but I believe that's just a matter of time before that will occur. So again, we have to kind of manufacture our own uh, talent to be able to meet the growth that's, that's coming our way. Um, I think the uh, other thing that I'm seeing from, from my perspective is uh, very similar to most of the retail world. We're seeing a significant uh, shift from bricks and mortar retail to more outpatient settings. Um, and I think that that's probably um, expected, uh, but I think it's something that is really just emerging in the healthcare arena. Texas was pretty far behind on that curve. They only recently passed legislation that allowed for televisits to occur, um, but we're trying to get caught up to that. You see some of the groups in California, over 50% of all their patient visits are done through some form of, of televisit. Um, and there's a number of social barriers that have to be dealt with that, obviously, to get Wi-Fi access and things like like that for the for the uh, patients, but that's again where we're trying to make investments for those that really need that. You're also seeing a, a dramatic increase in home visits. So we have a number of different home visit programs, uh, both for patients that are 
pallet that need palliative care that are uh, nearing the end of their life, people that are homebound but that need additional care, as well as just people that uh, uh, don't want to come in to see their primary care doctor. They want to be seen at home. So we've developed a whole uh, program that uh, gets uh, licensed clinicians to go into the home to get their uh, uh, care needs addressed, do some of the screenings that are necessary, close their gaps in care um, that, that uh, need to be addressed. Um, so I think you're gonna see a lot of that same demand that you're seeing in regular retail where people wanna be seen, where they want to be seen. Um, another big air thing uh, that you may see uh, driving around um, San Antonio is we have mobile units where we will go to uh, different um, physicians' offices to supplement their uh, s space as well as to uh, parking lots of different uh, uh, shopping centers. Um, so again, being able to get that access so that the patient can get access, I think is something that we see is gonna be very, very important um, uh, uh, for our future and for our patients' uh, future as well. I liken it a little bit, and my doctors always cringe when I say this, it's a little bit like your, the, um, your car. When your car is really sick, you gotta take it to the dealership. Uh, when it's not really sick, you don't have to take it there. You can take it to a quick check or someplace like that. So I think that that's kind of the mentality that we are trying to uh, get to, to where those licensed professionals can practice at the top of their license um, and see those patients that need it six, eight, ten times per year because they've got multiple chronic illnesses uh, that they're dealing with. The other thing that I see uh, from a, a um, uh, uh, social policy perspective in my mind is and the one adage that I've always believed is so goes Medicare, so goes healthcare. So I think what you're beginning to see is there are a number of groups like ours across the country that have aggressively embraced this Medicare Advantage program and are, we're now seeing that all the um, barriers to care that are eliminated, all the uh, uh, data and and uh, informational tools that we're able to feed to physicians, all of the things that we've learned from caring for Medicare recipients can now be applied to commercial and other populations. Um, if you look at the percent of the healthcare dollar for companies today that's consumed by 50 plus year olds, it is wildly disproportionate. Uh, um, I think the numbers I've heard is more than all the rest of the age groups combined. Uh, it's a combination of both number of people that sit in that demographic as well as the number of dollars that they consume. So I think what you're gonna see is that, that the doctors have proven that they could bend and lower the cost curve in the Medicare arena, and I think you're gonna start to see a carry-on effect of that to those uh, populations that sit in that 50-plus category. So I think the other piece that I'm seeing that's coming out of that is a lot more companies now are looking at the, a Medicare Advantage type of product for their group retirees. Um, and that includes uh, state employees and uh, teacher retirement system are now uh, uh, embracing and engaging in these type of uh, Medicare Advantage type uh, products because they, um, they, they naturally fit with their population and where they sit in that 50 plus year old and it makes it easier for them to age in to uh, those group retiree programs. So I think you're gonna see a really significant um, increase in the number of group retirees um, as companies try to figure out ways to, to uh, deal with their, uh, burden, uh, the burdens of their retirees on their P&L. Uh, so I think that that's something that you're going to see, even in, in uh, industries that have been pretty heavily unionized, I think you're seeing a lot of adoption of these kind of programs. So I think I will uh, uh, give up my last minute here uh, and cut it off at that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Brian. The, the only part I, I no longer like is the lumping of 50 and over. <laughs> I turned 50 this year, and now to be lumped in with all that 
segment doesn't feel quite so good. Um, so our last speaker, we tried to hit the, you know, the big sectors in the economy. We've got health care and financial services, and our last speaker is going to be Phil Green. Um, I don't think you can be and operate in San Antonio or in Texas and not have a tremendous amount of respect for Frost Bank. Uh, you know, I, I took a class on bank management when I was in college at Trinity, and we would do these cases, and at the end of the case, the bank always failed. Uh, we never had a Frost Bank case, Phil, um, so it was, it was uh, the exception to the rule. Uh, Phil serves as Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Cullen Frost Bankers, Inc. and Frost Bank. He joined the Cullen Frost organization in 1980 and served in a number of managerial positions in the company's financial division before being named Chairman and CEO in 2016. During his tenure at Frost, the company has become one of the nation's 60 largest banks and has increased its common stock dividend for 25 consecutive years. At the same time, he has won numerous accolades for excellence in customer service, including Forbes magazine's list of America's 100 best banks. He currently serves on the Federal Reserve Board's Federal, Adv Federal Advisory Council, serving the Fed's 11th District. Phil also serves on the Board of Directors of the Southwest Research Institute, on the Executive Committee of the Mid-Sized Bank Coalition of America, on the University of Texas at Austin Chancellor's Council Executive Committee, and my favorites, on the McComb School of Business Advisory Council and the McComb Scholars Program Committee. He also serves as a member of the Board of Directors of the Tobin Center for the Performing Arts and as a member of the Executive Committee and Board of Trustees of the United Way of San Antonio and Bexar County. Phil graduated with honors from the University of Texas at Austin in 1977, earning a bachelor's degree in accounting. Prior to joining Frost, he spent three years in public accounting with Ernst & Ernst. All these names of historic accounting firms that are no longer, no longer around. <laughs> uh, so with that, please join me welcome Phil to the stage. Well, thank you, Jay. It's great to be here today to talk about um, the outlook for San Antonio and, uh, and some industries that are important to, the, to our community, uh, namely financial services and healthcare. And um, we don't have much time, so I really want to talk about three things with you, and hopefully you can take something away uh, today. Uh, one is I want to talk about the outlook for 2020 from the perspective of a bank that's been here 152 years in this community. Secondly, I want to talk about disruption in the financial services industry in which we operate. And the third thing, I want to talk about how Frost Bank is responding to that disruption from both a technology and a service perspective. And hopefully you might find something that relates to your business. First, with regard to the um, economy and our perspective, it's what you've heard uh, all morning long. Um, it's a good economy. Our customers are optimistic about the outlook for 2020 in San Antonio. And I think that's broadly based across all sectors. What I will say, there are three caveats. One is the labor issue that you've heard about. The thing we hear most from customers, and I've heard it for at least three years as we call on customers, is I could do better with the opportunities that we have if I could get more available skilled labor. There's just not enough of it. Second thing uh, that I'd say is a caveat is what we heard about the energy industry. It's in a downturn. Yes, there's a coronavirus that's transitory, I think, with regard to prices today. I think the bigger issue for the industry has been the lack of available capital at a reasonable price, which has created uh, dislocations for people in the industry trying to generate liquidity and trying to refinance current capital and debt positions. Typically, discount rates have run 9 to 10 percent for uh, the asset classes and the, and the properties in the oil and gas uh, industry. I've seen that move up, uh, particularly in any distress situation. Those are now running 15 percent, 25 percent. I've even seen 40 percent discount rates. And those take a tremendous toll on the market value of the assets in that industry which support debt and equity investments. And then the uh, third thing I'll say is a caveat has to do with the political situation. I'd say over about the last six months, we've heard more customers express just a concern about uncertainty associated with the uh, political landscape. And it, most, it mainly takes the form of what happens with regard to regulation, what happens with regard to taxation, if there is a uh, what I'll call a big dislocation in terms of current policy into something that's dramatically different. And any time in uncertainty exists, I think businesses stop, they pause to evaluate the uncertainty and evaluate the risk. And so I think that's a caveat. But even with all those caveats, I would tell you that I believe our customers believe that 2020 in San Antonio 
will be a good year. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is with regard to disruption in the financial services business. That is a long discussion, but uh, suffice it to say is that there is change in this industry and there is disruption. But what else is new, right? Um, disruption is the natural order of things. You know, in my 39 years in Frost, I'll just look back on some of the disruption that I've seen. Um, the Merrill Lynch CMA account in the late 70s, early 80s, it's still in place today. Widespread distribution of ATMs really revolutionized the distribution of cash in the economy and our interactions with customers. The advent of branch banking in Texas. Now, most of you are too young to remember that, but I see some of my co cohorts out there that remember it, where you took Texas from a unit banking state to a branch banking state, a totally different way of delivery, which we had in place. The rise of the shadow banking system and non-bank lending, which is a larger and larger part of the economy. And then there was the check card interchange price controls that were introduced in Dodd-Frank as a result of the Durbin Amendment. Today's disruptors include a growing list of direct online banks, which specialize in higher interest rates, no branches, and limited services. And then there's a, uh, a group of financial uh, technologists, or fintechs as we call them, which are really too numerous to mention, and they have the advantage of avoiding regulation today and not having the responsibility currently of making a profit. But that's just our industry. This is true if you are a cab driver, if you're a hotel operator, if you're a grocer, if you're a retailer, if you own a restaurant, if you're a car dealer, and if you run a university. It's in, if you're in this room, chances are that you have been disrupted or will be disrupted by coming technology. Which brings me to the third item that I want to talk about, and that is Frost's approach to how we deal with technological disruption. Now, obviously, you can't avoid technology. Uh, you have to spend resources on it to be technologically relevant. Um, you know, I used to think that health care was the big uncontrollable cost for American business. I don't believe that anymore. I think that technology is that cost. It pervades everything that we do. And um, you have to, in our company, in our approach, you can't do everything. You have to remain focused because you can't spend your resources on everything. And so what we focus on is we focus on improving the customer experience as opposed to just cost reductions. And we found that if you improve the customer experience, cost reductions will follow. I'd also say that just with regard to technology generally, that um, the position would be you can't be great at everything but be great at what you can be. And occasionally you may be best in class. I think there's some examples where we are. But realize that you will never win the technological arms race. And as a general rule, what you need to do is be in the ballpark with your offerings through either partnerships or internal development so that you can neutralize the competition and win with service. And that's what I want to spend the balance of my time discussing with you is the importance of providing an empathetic customer experience, particularly as you deal with disruptive circumstances. Now, if you'd allow me, I'd like to use Frost as an example, really a case study of a company that is utili utilizing technology along with an empathetic customer service culture to deliver positive results. Again, I don't want, intend for this to be a commercial for Frost, but rather a bit of a case study using a company which I'm very familiar with that has provided and produce some interesting results. Now, keep in mind that we're a mid-sized company. We compete against the largest financial institutions in the world in an industry that has and will continue to suffer disruption from technology and new entrants. Now, I'm going to do this. I want to show you three slides. And uh, they are all representative of third-party validations of customer engagements of our company. J.D. Power, Greenwich and & Associates, and I'm going to talk about Net Promoter Score. First, and I'm going to do this quickly, uh, 
J.D. Power. Frost Bank has won the J.D. Power Retail Banking Customer Satisfaction Award for 10 consecutive years. It's like the county school being number one. And uh, they've only given the award for 10 years. So this is retail customer service. I think we've demonstrated excellence here. Let's look at Greenwich and Associates, which really measures commercial service levels and surveys of thousands of customers and, and how they view providers of financial services. We've received 29 Greenwich Excellence Awards, which is more than any bank in the country for four years in uh, consecutive years. Now, I want to talk about Net Promoter Score as well. And how many of you have heard of Net Promoter Score? Okay, a number of you. A number of you haven't. I'm gonna, in, in basically, what the Net Promoter Score is, is how willing someone is to recommend your business. And on a scale of 1 to 10, if you rate it 9 to 10 that you'll recommend that business, they'll take that percentage of people, and they'll subtract the percentage that rates you 1 to 6, and they ignore the middle. So it's the net of those two numbers. So if you look at a net promoter score of 50, that's an excellent score. 70 is world class. I want to show you what Frost net promoter score is. This is for 2018 and 2019, and you can see it's over 80%. Now, we show some other companies there on the bottom. You can see that, uh, and this is from Tempkin Group from 2018 analysis. And these can move around, but, my, but you can see there's some great scores with some of these great companies like Amazon, Apple, Chick-fil-A. Who doesn't like Chick-fil-A? Um, <laughs> and you can see some banks over there, which remain nameless, but they're pretty big. And um, what I, what I want to point out is that the net promoter score of the company, Frost, is really excellent. And um, we don't get there because of technology. I'll argue that our technology is very good, but these results are not technology driven. It's really our commitment to an empathetic customer experience that creates this difference. So you say, well, what, what do you mean empathetic customer experience? Well, I'll just give a few examples. How about when someone calls you, you answer the phone, right? <laughs> And if you call Frost Bank at 2.30 in the morning, someone's going to answer the phone, and they're going to say, hi, this is John, this is Sally, how can I make your day better? No call tree of death. You empower your employees, and you support your employees to go above and beyond for your customers. And then you celebrate it. And then you treat everyone as significant, not just because they're customers, but because they're people and they deserve to be treated that way. And if you don't believe that's true, just watch someone disrespect your own children and look at your individual reaction and tell me that people are not, not significant. I believe that a commitment and execution around this can help you win in a changing environment and a changing industry. And if you don't have a culture and a commitment to do this, I suggest that you start. We are huge believers in this as a critical element of our current and future success. Now, I want to end with a story about uh, the building that you see there. Uh, go back six years as we were just talking with Graham Weston and Weston Urban about building this new building in San Antonio. And as we were having those initial conversations, I remember a conversation that I had with Graham Weston. And Graham was talking about what I'll call the core competencies of cities. And he had some thoughts with regard to San Antonio, uh, how, how we might could do some things here to help, help us there. And the examples he gave were New York City and money and finance. What would New York be without money? San Francisco and technology. Houston and energy. And I thought it was fascinating. And I thought after that conversation, what is the core competency of San Antonio? And after thinking about it, I really believe the core competency of San Antonio is service. And if you don't believe it, look at the leading institutions in San Antonio. I would hold Frost Bank up as a world-class provider of service. But look at our friends at USAA. World-class reputation for outstanding customer service. Take HEB. Competes against the largest retailers in the world and does it with success and excellence. And how do they do it? They do it with outstanding customer service. Take Graham Weston, as I was just talking about. Took a startup business and created a billion dollar business around the idea of fanatical support. Take a look at 
I think one of the best examples of service. San Antonio is what? We're military city USA. No higher form of service that I can think of than what our military does and provides to us. And I'll even submit to you that take the, the community sports team, the San Antonio Spurs, an outstanding level of excellence, but based on a culture of teamwork, humility, service, and sacrifice. You know, at times I'll talk to people who are considering coming to San Antonio, and what I'll tell them is, you love your employees and you love what you, they do for your customers. But those employees, you're going to lose them one day because the calendar gets everybody, or you're going to want to expand your business. And if I'm going to expand a business, I want to be in a place that has a talent pool that's demonstrated success and competence in providing service to my customers. And that's why we've built a 450,000 square feet facility in Westover Hills to provide technology and support for our Frost customers. And while we're not moving from there, because we want to draw on that pool of great, competent service providers in San Antonio's. So if you don't believe that service is important, we built a city on it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Phil. I, it's, it's interesting, too, because we've been talking about disruption in higher ed, what's going to mean for us. And I was talking to an MBA student and said something like, what do you want to do when you get out? And he said, disrupt. I don't really know what that means um, in, in particular, but, uh, but it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, so I should have been mentioning, we've got question cards on your table. So if you have a chance, anyone should pull a question down. We've also got mics where you can uh, talk loudly, and we'll get your questions to the panel. Uh, so we want to have our remaining time so that you have a chance to ask our distinguished group what you want to hear more about. Um, to give you a little bit of time uh, to fill out your cards, I'm, I'll pose the first one. I'm going to come sit down. But uh, Phil mentioned this. Uh, this debate about the politics. So my question is, and I'll start with you, Keith, coronavirus or election, what's worse? <laughs> well, we, we, d we have a lot more information about the election. So the uncertainty comes from what candidate will be elected and what they'll be able to do. I think uh, there's a lot more uncertainty about the coronavirus. Fine. We <laughs> Being in healthcare, I'd say we, uh, uh, we, we, those are number one and number two, and they are uh, top of mind uh, for us on a, on a daily, regular basis. Um, I, I think that, that what the physicians tell me is that, that from the U.S. standpoint, we should be okay. Um, it's just uh, it's a specific strain of the virus. Um, but uh, until it gets under control, it's yeah. late to be seen. So, Phil, I took from your comments, you're, you think that the virus hopefully is transitory, but the election may not. Yeah, be exactly. Quite as we'll do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that's the way we see it. Yeah. Questions? And, and send your cards around one of our team or, or fire away. Please. Uh, in San Antonio, we're, we get bombarded by the new uh, trade. In San Antonio, we get bombarded by the new uh, trade agreement between the U.S. and Mexico in Canada. So I would ask um, our economist and our banker if this is going to have much of an effect on Texas and in San Antonio in particular. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, the USMCA, the, the biggest uh, thing is that it, it didn't kill NAFTA. I mean, NAFTA has been a good thing for San Antonio. We get, uh, we're not a big manufacturing uh, area. We do have manufacturers, uh, but we get a lot of uh, business uh, in terms of our tourism sector and other sectors, even healthcare, uh, from Mexico. And the trade agreement uh, continues uh, this uh, relationship uh, with Mexico and Canada. Mexico and Canada for Texas has been uh, are two top exporting uh, nations that we uh, export goods to. So I think it'll be, it'll be a, it won't be like a boom or anything, but it'll be a continued growth uh, uh, from that relationship. Uh, and if it hadn't passed and there was a, a ending of the, the trade agreement from NAFTA, that would have been really bad. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Texas is the largest exporting state 
in the country, and um, Mexico is our biggest trading partner. So if we hadn't have had that, you'd have dislocations and it'd create, again, uncertainty for businesses, and I think it would have slowed things down. It would have been bad for us. So I was glad to see it signed. Next. Please. This. <laughs> there, that's better. Okay. I was mentioning uh, a number of the presidential candidates are talking about Medicare for all, and I'm curious. I work with a number of doctors through our bank, and most of them are saying that would be the death of my practice. Uh, and I don't know if that's hyperbole or if that's serious, but I'd be curious to hear Brian's comment on the viability of a Medicare for all type of health plan. Well, Maybe it'd be good for WellMed. That question was going to come. Uh, um, I'll try not to make it a political <laughs> commentary, but I don't see how that could possibly get paid for. Um, and as a result of that, the only thing that I see that can happen then is uh, uh, price deflation, uh, which means lower salaries for physicians. Uh, the hospitals get, will get incredibly negatively impacted by that. Um, there just is such a differential in the pricing that exists between Medicare and the commercial arena. And if you force all that onto uh, Medicare, they're just, it, it, it is, um, it, I just don't see how it gets paid for. And I think you're going to end up um, seeing a lot more of a shift like you see in, in uh, the European countries. Uh, is what, it's the only thing that can happen. It's. <laughs> Air in the balloon, it's got to go somewhere. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's, that's the way that I see it. Our questions? Please. Good morning. If there was one thing you could say for San Antonio, let's say you were addressing you know, the leadership of San Antonio, community leaders, government leaders, thank you. Uh, one thing to say, Focus on this over the next 10 years you know, to accelerate growth. What would that one thing be? Uh, education. Education. Uh, now, it's, it's hard because local leaders don't have uh, the power to change education as much as we'd like. Uh, it's a lot of the control is uh, at the Capitol and a lot of state mandated programs that are pushed down to public schools. But education, I mean, really is a basis of the problems we have with, uh, with, with uh, income inequality, is basically education inequality. And if, you're, if, if San Antonio was known as the, the top education place, have the best schools in the country, we wouldn't have to worry about growth. I mean, we, we're doing good as it is, but if we really wanted to improve the outcomes for the whole uh, uh, area here for all people, the education part, and particularly reducing the inequality of education would be, the, I think, the, the top focus. I would agree with that. Um, you know, my dad didn't graduate from high school, and the only reason I'm sitting in this chair talking to you today is because I had the opportunity to go to a public university in Texas University of Texas, get an accounting degree from grade school. Keep and going, then, Phil, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was first first member of my, my family that ever got a college degree. And and so I've got six children who've been to college and, and, and there's that virtuous cycle of just taking that one life and investing in them and creating that, you know, the, the, the economic benefit of that going forward. And there's so many stories of that, and, and we need to do a better job for our community and for the people in it. Remember, everyone's significant. And that, that, that's what we need to do of, over the next 10 years, the best job of. Obviously, I agree with that. I talked about it during my, my speech, that uh, being able to have educated, licensed professionals is our single biggest gating item. And I think the opportunity in San Antonio for to be a center of excellence from a healthcare perspective 
um, and, and with, with Austin as well, uh, with the, the medical school, I think it's an incredible opportunity for those two uh, communities uh, in the long term and the impact they can have throughout the state and throughout the country on that. Thank you. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, a number of y'all touched on immigration and, and, and how they're dealing with your industries. Can you talk about what do you think um, immigration is going to look like in the next five to ten years and what we would like it for it to look like? Yeah, it's hard to predict what it will look like. Um, but, you know, economists, you know, it's clear that uh, human capital is essential to growth in the economy. Uh, I think immigration, uh, you know, I think a country should look at where it needs uh, labor, skilled versus unskilled and in between. Right now in this country, we need all kinds of labor, skilled and unskilled. Uh, it, you know, you can advance the guest worker program. A lot of workers want to come here and work in our ag industries where we have severe shortages and construction. Uh, and as was mentioned before, I mean, some people when, when Jay mentioned that the high percentage of foreign students might have said, why are we giving all those slots to foreign students? Well, first off, having foreign students makes your domestic students get a taste of what it's like in other countries. I mean, there's education there. And then people from other countries come here and they learn that the US may not be this terrible place that they've heard about. And then third, we get to bring all these skills in and we should be able to keep them after we educate them. So we have a severe shortage of high skill workers. And uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen the billboards in, in California that say, uh, H-1B visas are uh, open in Canada. And so they're attracting these workers to Canada and other places because we're not giving them the opportunity. So uh, hopefully what we'll have uh, going forward is uh, more immigration and more tailored immigration. Yeah, the part uh, we've seen, to give an example, business schools, we've lost, U.S. has lost market share to Canada and Australia to English-speaking countries that have more ability to attract people from globally, uh, many of whom want those opportunities to stay in those markets when they finish. And so we, we, the business school, a group of deans got together and what we're proposing is very similar, trying to get more skill-based immigration, uh, where we target certain places where we know we have shortages and we help talent come in those, in those areas of need, which happens to be, as you said, Keith, almost everything right now. Yeah, we see a lot of uh, foreign medical grads uh, that uh, would like to come and immigrate to the United States, and that'd be a great way for us to help with the shortage that, that we're facing and dealing with. Uh, I have a <coughs> question for y'all. Uh, Phil, I really liked your statement about service for San Antonio. Uh, but, you know, to add to what you said and kind of overlap several of the military is our medical, biomedical, one out of every five people in San Antonio work in the medical biomedical industry and that's a service industry and it really fits in it, it goes to the military also takes in high technology so it really is an umbrella and but it, we're really a service city and I first time I heard you say that I think it's very good second question is why did you pick your location for your financial service center <laughs> this is from the developer of Westover Hills <laughs> um, well, we had, we had a nice piece of land there, and uh, interesting, one of the things that we, we wanted to do was, um, had to do with the Edwards Aquifer. Uh, when, when you have a technology center that we initially went out there with, the data center, uh, we have thousands of gallons of diesel uh, for generators that you know, generate electricity in the event of a, of a problem with the grid, and um, you, you could only have 500 gallons over the aquifer of, mm -hmm. uh, of diesel uh, but you don't have that problem in Westover Hills. And so you also had fiber optic in the, in the area. So it was, it was great, and there were a lot of um, technology centers out there. So it was, just, it was a natural, and uh, so it's, it's worked out really good for us. And, and forgive me, I gave some examples on, on service and, and, and great leaders uh, in, the, in, the comp in, the, in the city, and I believe in them, but, but they're, just like Marty said, there, there are lots of examples. Make your own list. It's just, it's a great, it's, it's a great core competency of the city. 
Um, Phil, this question is for you. With all the changes in banking that's gone on over the years, what's the complete skill set profile of a successful banker today? Um, that's a difficult question because it's become so diverse. I mean, um, it could be a technologist, it could be a data scientist, it could be a, an accountant, it could be a, a, a finance professional that is a lender, it could be really almost anything. Um, and and we're, we're hiring and in need of all those and more positions. So it, it's not, you know, it's not what the industry was 50 years ago or whenever I first got into it. It's become much more diversified, much more uh, technology driven. And so it's, it, that's almost an impossible question to, to answer. But I will tell you that as we look for people to fill those positions, what we are first looking for are, are people that are really consistent with our core values of integrity, caring, and excellence. If we can get somebody in like that, I think they fit best with our company long term. Got time for one more. Anybody want to last? No pressure. Nothing? All right. We can end it there then. Thanks a lot to everybody for coming out. Hope to see you for the ninth one of these next year. And thanks very much to our panelists. Have a good day and hook them horns. <laughs>